The elves have their grand creation story. Their tragic decline from divinity is well known, and the reputation of the trickster Lorcan is immortalized in the form of Red Mountain, that hulking grey rupture in Nern's crust, which spews his lies as choking ash and his false promises as molten rock. This is largely due to the fact that, if the Anuad is to be believed, the elves are natives to Tamriel and arrived on Dawn's Beauty unscathed, while the wandering men were scattered on foreign lands. The sundering of Old Meris is merely a metaphor for their decline. The elves are Auriel's disciples, they are descendants of the Aedra, and their glorious heritage is integral to their identity. But what about men? The human races of Nern, the wandering Elnafe, would appear to share similar roots to the elves, the old Elnafe, yet their relationship with the divine is much more subservient. Lorcan, Shazar, or Shaw is revered for conceptualizing the mortal realm and facilitating the birth of mortality. And similarly, men kneel as lesser beings before Akatosh and the divines. But who's to say the humans of Nern don't have a divine past? If the elves can claim kinship with Auriel, then why can't men claim kinship with Akatosh? I believe there is a connection, but our knowledge of it is obscured by the mysterious nature of Nern's other continents. While the events unfolding on Tamriel during the early Merefic era are clear, and we know all about the diverging groups of Oldma as they came to occupy their corners of Tamriel, the ancient histories of Akavir, Yukuda, and Atmora are mostly unknown. Today I want to hone in on Atmora. The Nords have always claimed to be unlike the other mortal races. Nords consider themselves to be the children of the sky. They call Skyrim the throat of the world, because it is where the sky exhaled on the land and formed them. They see themselves as eternal outsiders and invaders, and even when they conquer and rule another people, they feel no kinship with them. It's easy to call this belief symbolic. Of course the Nords weren't born from Kine's breath. Of course, when we hear that breath and the voice is the vital essence of a Nord, it's simply a reference to their use of the storm voice, and nothing more. They are only men after all. Well, we seem to be willing to accept the preternatural tales of ancient elven history. We accept that the weakening Aedra gave up their power to provide structure to the world in the form of the earth bones. We accept that Auriel fired Lorcan's heart into the sea, where a mountain emerged from beneath the waves. But we seem to think that humans are mostly mundane, just because their earliest history, before their arrival on Tamriel, isn't documented. Some tales give us glimpses, like the Songs of the Return. Isgrimor the Harbinger and his 500 companions came from a time when stories were still full of magic and wonder, like when his son Ingol was lost in the storm of separation. Isgrimor commanded the sea ghost to surrender his kin, and a great gale darkened the sky. The seas thrashed and churned, and a wrathful storm appeared. Isgrimor took up the oars and rowed into the storm alone. Upon the sea, Isgrimor wrestled the sea ghosts, and the storm carried him along the jagged coast. Two fortnights passed without relief, until finally the storm broke. Come the next dawn, Ingol's longboat was found in the icy surf, but the vengeful sea ghosts had already taken Ingol and his clansmen. In his terrible grief, Isgrimor slew a dozen dozen beasts, and burned them in honour of his fallen kinsmen. A barrow hill was dug in the Atmoran tradition, and Ingol was laid to rest with rights and honours among his clansmen, far below the rocky face of Hussaric Head, the first children of the sky to perish in Tamriel. Had this story been about the Oldma, back when the gods roamed Somerset, we'd probably take it as gospel, but because it's about men, we tend to assume it's fantasy, embellished by the skulls. I think the earliest recorded Nords on Tamriel, Isgrimor and his companions, were not only magical, I think they were dragons. Hey guys, it's Drew here and welcome back to Fudge Muppet. We might need a minute to digest the gargantuan claim I just made, and I wouldn't blame you for closing the video and tuning in to a less ridiculous one, but I implore you to bear with me. If you're coming along for the ride, you'll need your Colovian tinfoil helm and a handful of grains from your salt pile. We're going to be getting into some out-of-law sources and some spacey theories, but we'll also supplement them with plenty of canon material, I promise. What I'm here to tell you is pretty simple. Isgrimor was a dragon, 
as were many of his companions. Their illustrious exploits made them timeless. They entered a process called Draco Chrysalis, where they ascended to Dragonhood, thus enduring the passage of time and the turn of the Kalpic Cycle. The Nords were the World Eaters when they crossed the Sea of Ghosts from Atmora, and when they landed in Skyrim, they became small, pink and fleshy. What did I say? Pretty simple, innit? I guess we should get started. We all know the story of Isgrimor's return. His may be the most famous name in all of Skyrim. He is to the Nords as Prophet Veloff is to the Dunmer. He led the Northmen to their kingdom in Tamriel. Isgrimor and his sons, Ingol and Ilgar, were among the first Nordic settlers of Skyrim, inhabiting the first major Nordic citadel of Sarfal. When the men discovered a mysterious power beneath the city, the Snow Elves coveted it, or so the stories say. The Falmer assaulted Sarfal in the night, massacring every inhabitant, but for Isgrimor and his two sons. As they fled back to Atmora, Isgrimor vowed to return to reclaim Sarfal, to keep the Eye of Magnus from falling into elven hands, and most significantly, to have his vengeance. The songs of the return are part history, part mythos. They read like the Norse Edda, full of tall tales about legendary heroes and heroines, gods and dragons. When history and folklore are intertwined, it becomes almost impossible to sift truth from myth. Immediately, from the very beginning of Isgrimor's song, it is hard to believe that three men could successfully crew a longship back to Atmora, across the Sea of Ghosts. Had they been capable of flight, it would have been considerably easier, but it's safe to say that more implausible things have happened in the Elder Scrolls. Isgrimor rallied his companions, and together they tore across Skyrim, raising every Falmer settlement to the ground, slaughtering every elven inhabitant, a massacre so complete that it culminated in the remnants of the Falmer race, descending underground and deteriorating into the blind, stunted creatures we see in the Fourth Era. Here are some of the supernatural feats, either poetic or literal, achieved by Isgrimor and his companions. Isgrimor wept tears of the purest ebony, which were used to forge the mighty axe Wulfrad. Isgrimor let loose a fearsome war cry that echoed across all the oceans. Jeek of the River led his crew to Whiterun Hold, and somehow two of his men, Menro and Manwe, who had assembled the glistening hull of Yorvaska, now carried the longship inland to its new home at the heart of Skyrim, in the great city of Whiterun. The crew of Crillot Lock were propelled westward after Kine lifted their souls and their winds. These wanderers came upon fearsome and terrible sights. Entire kingdoms of men beyond their recognition, skin charred like overcooked meat. This, of course, is a reference to Yakuda. They also flew across the swamplands of the Snake Men to the southeast, and Britta screamed her famed war cry so that all the marshes were emptied, only to be filled again by more Argonians in the future. While these feats, among countless others, may seem miraculous, you're probably wondering where do dragons come into this? Well, First things first, where dragons originated from is still the subject of debate. Akavir literally translates to Dragonland, and dragons do live in the Far East. But the dragons we see in Skyrim and throughout Tamriel came from the distant north of Atmora. The book titled The Dragon War states, In the Morefic era, when Isgrimor first set foot on Tamriel, his people brought with them a faith that worshipped animal gods. Certain scholars believe these primitive people actually worship the divines as we know them, just in the form of totem animals. Foremost among all animals was the dragon. In the ancient Nordic tongue, it was drag kon. Occasionally, the term dove ra is used, but the language or derivation of that is not known. Grand temples were built to honor the dragons and appease them. Dragons, being dragons, embraced their role as god kings over men. After all, were they not fashioned in Akatosh's own image? Were they not superior in every way to the hordes of small, soft creatures that worship them? The arrival of the Nords is undoubtedly connected to the arrival of dragons in Skyrim, and before the migrations to Tamriel, dragons were worshipped in Atmora. Dragons granted small amounts of power to the dragon priests in exchange for absolute obedience. In turn, the dragon priests ruled men as equals to the kings. Dragons, of course, could not be bothered with actually ruling. And the dragon cult was active in Atmora, not just Skyrim. The text titled There Be Dragons elaborates on the origins of dragons. There is no credible story of how dragons came to be, 
According to Dramora that the College of Whispers have questioned, they just were, and are, eternal, immortal, unchanging, and unyielding. They are not born or hatched, they do not mate or breed. There are no known examples of dragon eggs or dragonlings. The Iliac Bay area has stories of such things, but so far, all have proven false. This is where things get interesting. Dragons in the Elder Scrolls are not a naturally occurring species. If there is rhyme or reason to their existence, then it transcends mere biology. If dragons are not bred and hatched, then what makes a dragon? In the words of Parthenax, the Dover children of Akatosh, thus we are specially attuned to the flow of time. Time is the lifeblood of a dragon, and dragons are eternal, immortal, unchanging and unyielding. Thus they are timeless. You could extrapolate that to make the claim that any living thing that achieves immortality, that is unfettered by the constraints of time, is linked to Akatosh and is in some way a dragon. Don't worry though, that's not the claim I'm making here. That theory is thin and stretched like butter scraped over too much bread. I wouldn't entice you with the title, Was Isgrimor a Dragon? Just to hit you with the fact that, because his legend is immortalized in song, he is therefore a dragon. But I think it is important to look at dragons through this lens to better understand what I am getting at. To see dragons as big, angry, shouty lizards would be a mistake. Despite having scales, they're not second cousins to the Argonians, twice removed on their father's side. Their only kinship is with Akatosh. Okay, so where does the connection between Isgrimor and the dragons come in? Well, the first and most apparent link is in the name, Isgrimor. Dragon names tend to be trisyllabic, and made up of three words in the dragon language. For example, Alduin means destroyer, devourer, master, while Parfer Nax means ambition, overlord, cruelty, a name which he defied later in his story. Isgrimor follows the same pattern, and in the dragon tongue, Isgra Moro means ice battle glory. The notion that 500 Nords, no matter how fierce, could invade Skyrim and systematically eradicate an entire population of elves beggars belief. It's almost as unbelievable as Yara Greyjoy and five dudes infiltrating the Dreadfort and then getting scared off by shirtless Ramsay Bolton. But if the 500 companions had dragons in their midst, then the Thalmor would soon kneel to beg for mercy. Whatever the case, the songs are about the exploits of men, not dragons. They wield axes and shields, not claws and frost breath. It is an out-of-law source that goes deeper into the idea that Isgrimor and his kin were dragons. This out-of-law source was written by that familiar figure, Michael Kirkbride. Whenever we talk about Kirkbride's non-canon texts, I always give a small disclaimer, but this time I'd like to go a little further. There is no doubting the fact that anything that has not appeared in the games or novels is not technically canon, but I don't think that means we should simply throw away such sources. Kirkbride, among other names like Ted Peterson and Julian Le Fay of Once Lost Games, were part of the initial team responsible for conceptualizing the Elder Scrolls universe. Their work serves as the foundation of the lore we love to delve into. So, even when these names stop working for Bethesda, we shouldn't ignore their contributions. For example, Mankar Cameron's notorious monologue when the champion of Cyrodiil enters paradise was a rough draft Kirkbride sent in an email to Bethesda Softworks when he wasn't even employed by the company. Details like this are important to keep in mind when it's so easy to get bogged down in what's canon and what's not. Themes and stories have been woven into the Elder Scrolls tapestry by developers who no longer work for Bethesda, but those stories live on even when new minds are employed to take up the mantle. You could say new lore writers have mantled the old ones, like the champion of Cyrodiil mantled Sheagorath. In short, what I'm trying to say is, the foundations may have been set for lore that was never fully fleshed out. Kirkbride may have intended Isgrimor to be a dragon, or not, and maybe the new minds in charge of world building the universe chose to take on those ideas, or not. Either way, there is validity to out of law texts. With that diatribe aside, and a quick apology for rambling, I'm sorry, let's get to the source. It is called the 500 Mighty Companions or Thereabouts of Isgrimor the Returned and it lists in great detail all the members of the 500 Companions, along with their titles and nicknames. Some of these names are beyond a mortal's ability to enunciate, so I'll do my best to paraphrase the essential parts. The list of Companion members begins with Isgrimor's own kin. Here is an excerpt, 
and please forgive me for my pronunciations. The first of Isgrimor's 500 mighty companions was actually two, the ashen amalgamation of his sons that had survived Sarfal, only to die in the freeze rains of the returning. Named Sunaltir and Stunalmir when alive, and now called the Grit Prince Stunal, whose tear wives were Vramali, Yalial, Alair, and Tusk Widow, who forswore her name, whose wine wives were Elia Hatebasket, and Ingridal, who lost her casket at the burning, and Miarilial, whose half wives were none survived, and whose kind wives were none survived, and whose shield wives were Shunjenin, the Echo Eaten and Yarn's daughter, whose name stays in its cradle. There were also the 22 Thunder Shield women, ungiven to marriage, and so served as Isgrimor's oracle aunts until Kine would win them away. Unalt, Hrim, Kjelt of the Cult of Orki, Ingridol, who used her wine casket as a drum, Fjorli, Miemk, Sores Lee, and Shulf, whose gigantic shield was stripped from a Karstag man, Kella and Akela, who traded shields daily out of some Gius. Vemab, Borgasa, Nemyet, Vashina, Frekshield, Danalyet, Memyet Kamua, who held secret shield songs unneeded yet, and their five eldest, called the five eldest of the Thundershield women. There were also his ten totem uncles, whose names are too long for ink. Believe it or not, this is only the beginning, and some of the names that follow are about 20 to 30 syllables long. So why is this relevant? The text proceeds to list the names of many others, including mythical beasts, boat fanes, castag giants, successor heroes, and many more sons and daughters of Kine. But what's interesting is that the text documents the return from Atmora to Skyrim, and when Isgrimor caught sight of the Snowfroat, we see that the journey changed him, as if they were crossing an ocean of time. The name of his ship, the significance of which will be clear soon, was the World Eater's Waking. Isgrimor and his kin stepped ashore, shouting their victory and doom, but their names were as follows. Here we go. The boat fane was Ismalafax, the northerly dragon, preceded by his first clutch sons, Sunalin Faxtir and Stunu Haslifafnal, whose tearjils were Vora Malix, Yali Alyssa, Alira Sugus, and the list, as I'm sure you can imagine, goes on and on. The difference between this list and the one at the beginning of the text is that his Malifax and his kin are dragons, while Isgrimor and his family were previously described as men. These dragons landed on the shores of Skyrim aboard a ship called the World Eater's Waking, as if the 500 companions were the harbingers of the draconic tyranny that would engulf Skyrim for centuries. If you'd like to read this strange source for yourself, I'll link it in the description. But surprisingly, despite the barrage of nearly incomprehensible names, the content of the text is fairly straightforward. It's not asserting that the 500 companions who conquered Skyrim were dragons, but that they were dragons before the return. The final line reads, Of those Nords that stepped back onto Skyrim from the World Eater's waking, there were these among the 500. But Ismalafax counted that the first was his destroyer, Isgrimor the Returned. What this line is saying is that the voyage across the Sea of Ghosts transformed Ismalafax, the northerly dragon, into Isgrimor, the returned Nord. These pink fleshy creatures called Nords were once dragons and were world eaters in another Cowper. Just for those who aren't fully aware, a Cowper is a cycle of time. The Dawn Era is the end of the old Cowper and the beginning of the new. Imagine the self-eating serpent, the Ouroboros, where the tail meets the mouth is where time resets. What remains to be determined is whether this transformation was literal or metaphorical. The notion that the 500 companions, or at least Isgrimor's lineage and dynasty, were metaphorically dragons is fairly easy to justify. As I mentioned before, dragons are not natural biological creatures in the familiar sense. They are timeless beings, tiny shards of the divine hourglass, the Akka Oversoul. So, if you task the Nordic Skulls with finding a connection between their great heroes and the timeless beasts they worship, it wouldn't be too challenging. The dragons are powerful and immortal, and the heroes of Nord history, they too were powerful. And when their mortal bodies yield, their souls endure eternally, both in the memories of the people and at the great feast in the Hall of Valor. But what if the claim that Isgrimor was a dragon was not purely metaphorical? There's an obscure theory that originated in the depths of Apocrypha, 
suggesting that one of the methods by which mortals can achieve immortality is by becoming a dragon. You've heard of Kim, you've heard of the Towers, but have you heard of Draco Chrysalis? Frankly, you'd have to be as weird as me to know that word, and if you do, I hope the weather is nice for you in the Shivering Isles. There is only one mention of this word, and it comes from the Numantia Intercept, a popular non-canon text written of course by Michael Kirkbride. It says, the Ultima sought to focus on Draco Chrysalis, or keeping the Elder Magic bound before it could change into something lesser, an act which ironically required a ferial surplus. In context, this excerpt is talking about how the High Elves attempt to achieve ascension, apotheosis. If the Intercept is to be believed, Draco Chrysalis is a means of escaping the mortal realm and returning to Aetherius, a feat the Ultima have endeavoured to accomplish since the beginning of recorded time, since they devolved from the Aedra after the dawn. Alas, there is no definition provided for Draco Chrysalis, but the name itself is fairly self-explanatory. Draco means dragon, and is therefore tied to the god of time Akatosh, or Auriel as the elves would insist he be called. A chrysalis is the pupa or cocoon that some insects use when advancing through the stages of their life cycle, i.e. a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. So, Draco chrysalis must therefore be the process of a mortal becoming a dragon through some kind of metaphysical pupation. Of course, if a mortal were seeking to undergo this process, they would not be interested in becoming a dragon in the biological sense, but rather because dragons are timeless beings, fragments of Akka that exist unrestricted by the trickling of the sands and the renewing of the Kalpic cycle. If Isgrimor and his kin were dragons, then it happened as a result of Draco Chrysalis. They achieved so much and shaped the history of the mortal realm so significantly that they became timeless and sailed into the new Kalper aboard their longship, the World Eaters Waking. But in order for this theory to work, we need to go one layer deeper and rely on another theory. What did Isgrimor and his Nordic followers do in a previous Kalper to reach Draco Chrysalis? The short answer is that the Nords are trans Kalpic World Eaters. But what in the Flying Foos does that mean? Well, Mankar Cameron, in his Mythic Dawn commentaries, describes the fall of Lig in another Kalpa. Mayrunes threw down Lig and cracked his face, declaring each of the 19 and 9 and 9 oceans free. By the magic word Numantia, a great rebellion rose up and pulled down the towers of Kimel Garjig, and the Templars of the Upstart were slaughtered, and blood fell like dew from the upper wards down to the lowest pits where the slaves with maniacal faces took chains and teeth to their jailers, and all hope was brush fire. Sons were riven as the Red Legions moved from Lig to the hinterlands of Chill, a legion for each get, and Kuri was thrown down, and Jaff was thrown down, and Hormagile was crushed with cold salt, and forevermore called Hall, and so shall it be again under the time of gates. Under the Myers, Malbioge was thrown down, that old city of chains, slaked in new bone warmth and set free. Galg and Morgalg were thrown down together in a single night of day, and shall it be again under the time of gates. Know that your hell is broken, people of the Orbis, and praise Numantia, which is liberty. This is Mankar's recount of Lig's destruction, an event that on first inspection has no relation to the current Kalper. There is a theory that this rebellion was carried out by the Nords. I'd like to give credit to the OP of this grand conspiracy theory, but the Bethesda forums have been sunset, meaning these old posts are no longer accessible, and they've faded away in a previous Bethesda.net cowper. Anyway, connections have been drawn between the Mythic Dawn commentaries and the 500 Mighty Companions. In the verbal labyrinth that is the 500 Mighty Companions, there are parallels between the destruction of Lig and the titles of the many Nords. One example reads, Vraga the Gifted, born under the strange suns, meaning the son of Old Mora and the son of Mereflant. If we buy into Kirkbride's assertion that the Dawn Era is the end of the previous Kalpa and the Merefic Era is the beginning of the new, then the presence of two strange sons could mean the death of the old sun and the birth of the new. Mankar Cameron mentions the legions travelling to the hinterlands of Chill, which could be a reference to the wandering Elnafe finding their way to Skyrim. Mankar calls the people who destroyed Lig the Red Legions, while the 500 Mighty Companions includes a multitude of red titles. There's Morgan the Red, Rebek the Red, and Ragam the Red Kalpa, 
who held two cowpers, one in either eye. There's Olwep the Bald, who couldn't stand so many reds, and Red Relder, who was one of the triplets conceived despite the chains holding them to their oars. The Gi and Get mentioned by Mankar also appear in the 500. Karma Gi and Yori Gi, and Ut Gi, the Old Get, and Yun Gi, the Tailor. Mankar says Jaff was thrown down, and the 500 says Jaffid, who cracked his face across the ice. There's also Disselveb, the Stoic Shout, whose dew claws were adorned in Numantia scratch. Numantia is a term used frequently by the rebels of Lig, a war cry that means liberty. The 500 even explicitly mentions Lig, and Kaya, the weird looking Lig. None of these quotes are smoking guns that the Nords destroyed Lig, but it does align with the idea that the companions were dragons. Alduin, the World Eater's role in Mundus, is to end the previous Kalpa and initiate the new one. If the Nords were the slaves who demolished the towers of Lig, then they served Alduin's role, and their return is not only the journey to Skyrim, but the journey from one destroyed world to a new one. That would be why Isgrimor's ship was named World Eater's Waking. From an elven perspective, humans actively serve to maintain the mortal realm. They have no desire to escape the cycle, and they fight for Shaw, who is the antagonist of Auriel, the deity who tells the elves to seek a path back to Aphirius. To the elves, humanity is analogous to Alduin, the force that keeps the cycle in motion. We know that the Nords wiped out the dragons in the Dragon War, but there are stark similarities between this war and the destruction of Lig. The dragons were tyrants in Skyrim, whereas the dregs were tyrants in Lig. But according to Mankar Cameron, the two races are not too dissimilar. The Mundex Terene was once ruled over solely by the tyrant dreg kings, each to their own dominion, and border wars were fought between their slave oceans. They were akin to the time totems of old, yet evil and full of mockery and profane powers. No one that lived did so outside of the sufferance of the dregs. Mankar states the dregs were akin to the time totems of old. What comes to mind when you think of time totems? Well, the Nords worshipped the totem animals who depicted their gods. And which of these animal totems is associated with time? The dragon totem, Alduin. Michael Kirkbride has called Lig an adjacent place, as if it is a reflection of Mundus. In Mundus, the Nords defeated the dragons and the World Eater was sent forward in time. In Lig, the Nords defeated the dregs, but they went a step further. With Mehrun's Dagon's guidance, they fulfilled the role of Alduin and unmade the world, manifesting Numantia, liberty. So when they sailed to the current Kalpa, they came as world-eating dragons. But the dawn ended and the Merefic began, the cycle renewed, and Ismalafax returned as Isgrimor. While on the topic of Mankar Cameron, he might actually be the closest canon example of a mortal achieving some form of Draco Chrysalis. Roaring I wandered until I grew hoarse with the gospel. I had read the mysteries of Lord Dagon, and feeling anew went mad with the overflow. Offering myself to that daybreak allowed the girdle of grace to contain me. When my voice returned, it spoke with another tongue. After three nights, I could speak fire. We've analysed this on the channel in detail before. By the sounds of it, Mankar Cameron managed to use Mehrun's razor to change his biology. When he was finished, he was able to speak fire and wear the Amulet of Kings, something that only a Dragonborn should be able to do. If Mankar Cameron altered his physical form to be Dragonborn, then he did achieve a kind of Draco Chrysalis. So, with all of this information, we can distill it to a few possibilities. The Nords, specifically Isgrimor and his companions, might be dragons in a metaphorical sense, as they were the heroes who have been immortalised in song and memory. The Nords might be dragons in a metaphorical sense because they are responsible for the slave rebellion that vanquished Lig, effectively eating the world. Or they might be dragons in a literal sense. They might have achieved Draco Chrysalis by fulfilling the role of the World Eater in Lig and enduring the end of one Kalpa and the beginning of the next. This endurance would make them timeless beings, fragments of the Time God, World Eaters. And there you have it. This video is probably the most speculative, out there video I've ever made, so I'd love to hear your opinions. Whether you buy it or think it's a load of dragon shit, it's really fun to dive into the most obscure Elder Scrolls theories. I hope you enjoyed it too, and thank you so much for watching. My name's Drew, this is Fudge Muppet, I'm out of breath, 
and I'll see you in the next one.